Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to, for today's Be Well Education session. My name is Mariah Bruner and I am UCA's Wellness Coordinator. Today's session is called Nutrition Tips to Improve Your Cholesterol and it will be presented by UCA's very own Dr. Alicia Landry. Dr. Landry is an assistant professor and dietetic internship director in the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences. As a registered dietitian nutritionist, she brings quite a lot of expertise to this conversation, which I know is particularly relevant now that many of our employees have completed their biometric screenings and you are eager to know more about your cholesterol values and how to improve them. Uh, this session will last about 25 minutes. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. If you have a question along the way, don't be shy. You can submit it to the chat box and we'll get to those at the end. And at the end, I will also, um, also share the process for claiming your five lifestyle reward points for your attendance today. So um, Dr. Landry, thank you so much for being here today and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> okay. So I'm super excited to be here and talking about uh, nutrition tips to improve your cholesterol. Um, today, our learning objectives are to understand what cholesterol is, its function in the body, ideal cholesterol values, and then thinking about what risk factors we have to, be, uh, to have high cholesterol, understanding how high cholesterol can impact our diet or vice versa. And um, there's also some resources from the American Heart Association that are particularly relevant that we'll share towards the end. And so cholesterol is particularly important to me. Um, it's something I have researched a lot about just kind of in my, you know, not like official academic research, but just kind of for my own background because as a, you know, I've always had high cholesterol as an, an adult. And so, you know, it's, it came to the point where um, it's like, you know, what's happening. I, um, don't really know too much about my father's um, chronic disease. He passed away pretty early in life, so we don't know much about his cholesterol or what it would have been as he aged. But with my mom, her both females and males on her on my mom's side of the family have high cholesterol. Um, even though they might be, they might look perfectly fit on the outside, they still have um, heart problems and cardiovascular disease and cholesterol. And so, obviously, I got those genetics. And so as I began to age, it came down to, do I wanna take a pill forever or am I really gonna get serious about this and quit making excuses or waiting until the next time I had a physical or a biometric screening and hope that it improved. So um, what I decided to do was really just take it into my own hands because I'm not responsible enough to take <laughs> cholesterol medicine every day. Um, so. And if you see me looking over to the side, I'm looking at two screens, so I apologize for that. But um, so cholesterol is important and it's waxy fat-like substance that's found in your body and your body has to have cholesterol. And so that's one thing, you know, you can cut all the cholesterol out of your diet. I mean, you could eat no cholesterol whatsoever and you're still going to have it because your body produces it. Um, and you need cholesterol because it helps your hormones function. And I remember one of my first experiences as a clinical dietitian um, was a man who had um, these, they were very unexplained, but it was like um, pustules all over his face and neck and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And he was in the hospital on and off for a long time. And then finally we realized his triglycerides were over 10,000. And so that was actually the cholesterol in his body coming out of his pores. And so that's the first time that I ever saw that. And, um, it's really interesting to think how our body can accommodate for whatever's happening internally. Um, so things that you might see, especially like on your biometric screening reports or uh, lab reports that you get from your primary care provider would be things like total cholesterol, HDL or high density, um, low density lipoprotein, LDL, very low density lipoprotein, your VLDL, your triglycerides, and then um, kind of what's up and coming. And the reason why I have the asterisk beside it is this your total cholesterol to your HDL ratio. 
which is actually looking like that's becoming more important than just your HDL value, HDL and total cholesterol values. It's the ratio of the two together. Um, and so your low density lipoprotein, always remember that as L, um, as lousy. And so your lousy or lazy low density lipoproteins, when they're in your arteries and veins, they settle down to the um, bottom and form plaques and build up. And what happens with your HDLs is they're the hardworking ones for H and they're like sweepers and they come in and they sweep all of the inflammation and the LDLs out. So the more HDL you have, the better because the more clean your veins and arteries are gonna be, the more LDL you have, the worse off you are because that's more plaque and more buildup that could cause um, cardiovascular damage. So um, the university uses Be Well, uh, our wellness program is Be Well, and we are partners with Health Check 360. So these are, um, this is what your school report would look like um, in the portal once you get it. And so I pulled this out just to show you um, kind of, you know, the ranges that we're looking at. So your ideal um, cholesterol, total cholesterol to HDL ratio is less than 3.4 in women and less than 3.5 in men. Um, so it's still acceptable. So like on a lab value report, you would see like 3.4 to 5.0 probably um, as the range. And if it's still within five, or below 5.0, then you're not going to get flagged as high because it's still um, fairly healthy. Your HDL ideal is to have it greater than 60, um, and I'll get I'll talk about that a little bit more because it's weird to think that we want you to have a higher cholesterol value, but we do. We want you to have a higher HDL, and then LDL you want that less than 100. <clears throat> excuse me, and your tri triglycerides you want less than 150. And remember, I told you that the patient that we had was over 10,000. So, I mean, that's exponential to what it should be. Um, and a lot of that was genetics. Um, so with your HDL, you know, um, sometimes people's total cholesterol will be high, like over 200. And their HDL might be a function of that. So if your HDL is 100 or 110, awesome, that's fantastic, but your total cholesterol is probably going to look a little high. And again, what really matters is that total cholesterol to HDL ratio. So risk factors for high cholesterol, genetics, age. So as you age, um, your cardiovascular system has um, increased workload, it's not as efficient, and plaques build up over time. And what's super stinky is nowadays we're seeing like 12 year olds with um, plaque buildup and atherosclerosis because of cholesterol intake. And so, um, you know, you might even have 13, 14, 15 year olds on Lipitor and things like that to control their cholesterol. Different medicines can make you produce more cholesterol or they can make you hold on to it more. Um, obesity and overweight increase your risk factors. What you eat does have a big impact and inactivity and smoking can also increase your cholesterol. So how can you lower it with diet? You can choose healthier fats, you can eat plenty of fiber, you can choose your food overall wisely and then create balance. And so what I want you to notice in this is that there's nothing that says limit. There's nothing that says completely exclude or disregard. Um, you know, one thing that's really important with your diet is how acceptable it is to you. Because if you hate it, you're not going to do it. So, you know, everything on here, we want you to choose what you like and um, work, work through that and create a balance. And so the American Heart Association recommends limiting your total fat to 25 to 35% of your total um, calories and your saturated fat to five to six percent and also to minimize the amount of trans fat you eat. So I thought it would be helpful just to have this chart up here um, with calories per day because sometimes it's like okay what's 25 to 35 percent of what I'm eating I don't even know what I'm supposed to be eating anyway 
Um, generally, females are between 1,500 and 2,000, depending on how active they are. 1,800 is probably a typical goal. Um, and then males, about 2,000. If you're training or you're endurance athlete or something like that, you might see the 2,500 calorie limit. Um, and so what this chart does is convert that percentage of your calories into grams. And so um, the total fat grams, if you're on a 1500 calorie diet, would be between 42 and 58 grams per day. So if you go over to that nutrition label, you look at the serving size and then how, much, how many fat grams are in that serving. Um, so for this example, there's eight grams of total fat in this two thirds cup of whatever this is. Um, and so you would set, subtract your eight grams if, from your 58 gram total. So your bank would only have 50 grams of fat left in it for the day. Um, your saturated fat, you wanna hold that at eight to 10 grams. And then ideally you have no trans fats um trans fats are a whole other education session in themselves and it's just the way that they're produced um, in processed foods that make the food more shelf stable and so it changes the molecular structure of the fat and that's what makes it hydrogenated and that's what makes it shelf stable but that's also what makes it very dangerous for humans um, so um, one thing I love to remind, I'm all about trying to remember. So um, hard workers, you know, for your HDL, lousy or for your LDLs, and then solid and saturated. So S and S. So if you have a solid fat, it means it's saturated. So again, that's a chemical term um, for how many hydrogens are on the fat um, or make up the fat. And so if it's a solid fat it's going to be solid inside you so kind of you know that's it's that's oversimplified but that's kind of the way i like to think about it is if um you know you think about like crisco at room temperature it's solid so it's a saturated fat so it's going to be dangerous for my cardiovascular system and so um, if you are watching your fats and thinking about how to improve your cholesterol through your diet you wanna choose those healthier ones like oils. So canola oil, safflower, sunflower, sun, uh, soybean, olive oil, and you want to avoid those solid fats like butter, lard, or shortening. And so just a few ideas about using liquid oils. Uh, you can use them for a lot of things that you would use butter or lard in. Um, and I have outlawed or um, marked out the coconut oil because coconut oil is still a saturated fat. It comes from a plant, but it's still saturated. And when you look at the chart of the amount of saturated fat in coconut, uh, it actually rivals lard pretty closely. So I would say definitely avoid that coconut oil in your food. Um, so low fat dairy is another way to improve um, cholesterol and so dairy is important for our diets. Um, I think sometimes as adults we decide not to choose dairy, um, but dairy is important especially for um, females who might have bone density issues. So low fat and skim milk you can use in recipes um, in place of whole milk or half and half. You can get fat free half and half and use that. Um, the problem with using low fat and fat free is that sometimes it'll give you a softer set like in a pudding or um, a mixture like that. Um, so you might need to you know, put a little extra starch or something to help thicken it up. Um, but you can use low fat cottage cheese, low fat or part skim mozzarella uh, and other low fat cheeses. And one thing I do with my students every semester is have them make their own cheese and out of um, like skim milk, 2% milk, whole fat. And actually the 2% milk is what gives you the biggest return <clears throat> from the quantity of milk that you use into the cheese that you produce. Um, so that's always a fun experiment. And so um, 
foods with lower cholesterol. So again, we're not saying limit your food. We're just saying choose those ones that have lower cholesterol. And if you want bacon once in a while, add it in, but make sure that there's a balance to that. Um, so these are, I don't want to go through all of these points. I know it's a lot of text on the slide, but the slides will be posted. Um, and, you know, the idea is that you choose meat that is lower in fat and you drain it. Um, when you cook it, if you brown hamburger, then you rinse it before you use it. Um, instead of using meat drippings to cook or to baste, use like a cooking wine or a broth, something like that. Um, and then the picture on the um, bottom of that slide is what um, one of my um, students endearingly named meat jelly. Um, so the it's a pork roast and you can see the meat and then the brown jelly around it is the collagen that cooks out of the meat um, when it's roasted. But that white chunky stuff is the fat. And so what that meat has been, they roasted it, took it out of the oven, put aluminum foil on it, put it in the refrigerator and let it cool overnight or for a couple of hours. And then you can go in and just scrape off all of that white fat and throw it away and you've saved yourself a lot of saturated fat consumption. But when you warm it up, the fat melts and you can't really separate it out as easily. So even with um, soups and chili and stews and broth and things like that, you cook it, cool it off, skim the fat, and then warm it up and, and eat it. So soluble fiber, I couldn't resist the darn tootin' um, emoji because of the fiber. Um, always, 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 if you increase your fiber content, increase your water um, intake because it causes bad problems if you, or if you aren't drinking enough fluid and you increase your fiber. So think about all of those places where you use um, just white breads and grains. So Cheerios has the FDA approval to put um, Heart Healthy on their packaging because they have so many whole grains in per serving. So what whole grains, what soluble fiber does is actually, um, it's not digested in your stomach, it's actually digested by microorganisms in your large intestine or your colon. And so when it's in there and the fat is passing through your body, that fiber collects all that fat and pushes it through um, your colon and you excrete it. And so that's one reason why it's so important to increase your fiber when you're thinking about your cholesterol is because cholesterol is just floating around in your body. And so if you have that fiber in there to soak it up and take it with it when it leaves, then you have a huge, you've just done your body a huge favor. So increasing fiber, uh, especially whole grains is really important. Um, whole grain pastas, and it doesn't have to be the um, like whole grain wheat pasta. Um, it can be like a whole, like a blend of corn, quinoa and rice. Those cook a lot more similar to traditional pasta than the whole wheat pastas do. Uh, fruits and vegetables. So instead of using lard or vegetable oil in things like muffins and cookies, you can use applesauce, prune puree and brownies. Um, even avocado mushed up in brownies is really good. Zucchini bread, pumpkin breads, you can use all of those as fat replacers. And then it also increases your fiber intake. So you get a two for one deal on that. And you know, think about your salads or your sandwiches. What can you add to those um, to get a little bit more fiber in? So like when I'm on the go, um, Sonic has an amazing chicken tender sandwich. And so I say, hold mayo, add tomato, add pickle and extra lettuce because then that's getting me i still get a cheap sandwich that's nourishing to me and it has a little bit of cholesterol in it just because it's fried chicken but i've also increased my vegetables not significantly but i can make up for that later on um, rather than just not having anything at all at least i've gotten some fiber in there and it'll keep me fuller longer and i won't want to snack as much and um, I think a lot of times we just use butter, salt, things like that to make our vegetables taste better. 
but herbs and spices can do that without the fat and the salt added. So enough said about lower salt, just lower the salt. Um, avoid processed foods as much as you can, and if you can't, then make compromises other places. Gatorade is the worst offender for sodium. Um, you want to limit to yourself to, and there I did say the L word, to about 2300 milligrams a day, which is only one teaspoon, so that's not very much salt. Um, and so this is all the salt or sodium interchangeable when we're talking about food like this. Um, and so number one tip, pro tip, just take the salt shaker off the table, put it in the pantry and shut the door. Because when you sit down to eat and you're like, man, I need some salt. And then you look and it's like all the way in the pantry, you're not gonna go get up and get the salt shaker just to come back. And then you start getting used to less and less salt. Um, so beverages that aren't alcohol, again, not saying to cut them out completely, just saying that limit those, um, again, the L word with the sodium and the alcohol, but you want to make sure with alcohol that you're choosing wisely, and um, there is nothing worse for triglycerides than beer. And you can almost always tell when I was in clinical, when somebody had been drinking beer the night before, they would come in to the hospital or for a, vis a clinic visit and their lab values, their triglycerides would be through the roof. And beer is one of, it's the worst offender. Um, so, you know, choose your drinks wisely. Make sure that um, what you do choose is within the within reason for your diet and your dietary goals. And just a side note here, you can't save up your one or two drinks per day and have a bender and call it a, a done deal because that your cholesterol doesn't recognize that that way. Um, and then also make sure you know that a drink is clearly defined. So our fish bowls do not count as one drink. Um, and so just these, again, not going to go through every single one of these, but um, the slides will be posted. Uh, so it might be helpful to have these and cut them out or put them on your um, to-do list. If, you're, if you use like grocery pickup from Kroger or Walmart, have these available so that as you're going through your groceries that you look and you can see the options that you have for you. And there's a ton of options. So that's one thing with diet is you never want to sound like you have to restrict yourself from something is about the choices that you make. And so these are some options to help you make some really, really good choices. Um, so things just like the snacks to keep in, keep on hand. Um, and you can see that most of those are whole grain or very fiber rich snacks. So um, with the resources, this um, hyperlink and then the image is hyperlinked and it will take you to a PDF cholesterol guide which is very helpful walks you through some other dietary tips and how to monitor and um, explains more in depth about a few things and then we have some little kits from the American Heart Association that we're giving away so if you're interested in one of those kits when you email Mariah, um, after the session is over, just request one of those kits and we'll get it to you um, next week. We do have a limited supply, so um, it's kind of a first come, first serve, first request thing. But um, in that kit is a color, very colorful, very pretty recipe book, different information about grocery shopping and how to make choices at the grocery store. Um, and some little hand weights to help you um, get that heart rate up and push that cholesterol on through. And um, just in case anyone is interested, I, I have my nerdiness to leave with you. Um, these are three pretty decent research articles, two are meta-analyses, and really I want to leave you with that thought at the end um, that not the significant weight loss was observed with any low carbohydrate or low fat diet. I mean, that's any diet, any diet that you're going to go, that you're going to start. Um, it's like a fad diet. You're going to restrict one macronutrient or another. Um, but what the key point is here is that weight loss between the different diets is small. The differences is small. But also what the idea, the whole point is, is any diet that a patient adheres to is worth doing, is worth recommending. 
Um, even if it's modest amounts of weight loss, you know, modest amount would be one pound every other week. Um, one to two pounds a week is good weight loss because you want it to be healthy, you want it to be sustainable, you don't want it to harm you in the long run. And so, um, you know, a very, very big advocate, proponent, however you want to say it, for flexible dieting because you, you know, you begin to resent things if you feel like they're restricting you or holding you back from um, from enjoying something. And your diet isn't just something that you do on a day to day thing. It's a, it's a lifestyle. Your diet is a complete lifestyle. And so, you know, if you are facing high cholesterol issues and you want to use your diet to reduce that, um, risk or to reduce your cholesterol, you know, top things that I can, you know, just spout off the top of my head are to have, um, consistent high fiber diet because that fiber is going to carry that cholesterol out with it reduce your sodium because a lot of the things that you find sodium in are also high fat and high cholesterol and so you get that one package reduced right there and then watch your alcohol intake because as there are certain offenders that are worse than others as far as alcohol is concerned um, so with that i think we're doing pretty good on time we have any questions? Yeah, don't be shy. If you have any questions, you can uh, you can unmute yourself or you can put them in the chat box. Um, we'll just take a few more moments and see if anything comes in, and then we will wrap up. Okay, we have one here. Uh, the question comes from. Um, Kari, she said, how does venison compare in terms of cholesterol to other meats? I have always been told that wild game is low in cholesterol. That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. So venison is low in cholesterol. It depends on the cut, just like other meats. And you also, you know, it depends on your processor. If they're, uh, I know our processor usually um, cuts the venison with pork fat. So you have to be careful there. Um, and make sure that you're given specific instructions about what's actually in the venison. Um, and, you know, the like duck um, and things like that actually do have a lot of cholesterol and fat in them. So it's not across the board for game, but yeah, definitely for venison, they're very lean. Okay, we've got another one. It said, I've heard that table salt is not as much of an offender as salt in processed foods. Can you speak to this? Yeah, so that's salt is salt. Um, so sodium salt, you know, when we're talking about um, food packaging, that is the, I think probably they're both gonna have the same effect when it gets to your body. You know, when, when you eat like a cracker and your um, enzymes on your tongue start breaking that down into carbohydrate and salt and fat, I mean, it, your body doesn't recognize one source from a different one. Um, but I think that probably the, in, maybe the intent of that idea is that, um, in processed foods, you don't taste it because it's there to, um, salt is usually in processed foods to preserve them. So for example, like Oreos, um, little Debbie snack cakes, you know, there may be a hundred milligrams of sodium in a coffee cake and it's why it doesn't taste salty, but it's there to help preserve it. So, um, definitely uh, look at those labels and I, I would still say that salt, um, salt is salt. Good question. That was a good question. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm guessing that Dr. Landry has a few more moments. I'll wrap us up and then if you think of something, you can always come in at the end after I stop the recording and ask. So just to wrap up, um, you uh, be well participants. If you are a be well participant, you can claim five lifestyle reward points for this session by emailing me, mbruner1 uca.edu. You can just use the simple subject line, nutrition tips or nutrition tips to improve cholesterol. I'll know what that means. I will send you a certificate of attendance. I'll send you a copy of Dr. Landry's slides um, and a link to a very short online session evaluation that's very helpful to us. Um, let us know how we're doing. 
And then also if you were interested in one of those kits, um, I've already, I, I can see my email right now, I've already got a few requests. So um, along with that email, if you're interested in one of those kits, first come first serve, let me know and I will arrange to get that to you. So um, thank you, Dr. Landry, so much. This was probably one of my favorite sessions that we've ever done. Um, very informative and comprehensive too, all in 30 minutes, so that's wonderful. <laughs> very impressive. One more plug, one more plug <laughs> okay. for HDL. The yes. number one way to get your HDL up is physical activity. So even walking, that heart rate is really what will do it. So I forgot to say that earlier about your, um, your good cholesterol. The way to raise it is mostly through physical activity. Sorry. That's a really good reminder. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you, everybody, for attending. I'm going to stop our recording.